From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Coming up, K-State's Ernie Minton and Oklahoma State University's Tom Kuhn will discuss an initiative that brings to light a critical need for agricultural research infrastructure improvements at land-grant universities across the nation, including K-State and OSU. Also, K-State's Sarah Lancaster will be joined by Purdue University's Bill Johnson to talk about field sprayer cleanout following herbicide applications. They say that process has become increasingly important with the ever-changing herbicide lineup. Later, K-State's Romulo Lulato reports from day two of the hard winter wheat tour of Kansas and adjacent states. And K-State's Gus Vanderhoven is back with another Stop, Look, and Listen. All that here on Agriculture Today. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters, such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network, and welcome once again to Agriculture Today. Well, public-funded agricultural research at the hand of land-grant universities can fairly be said to be at a crossroads right now. Institutions are now challenged with uh, research facilities headwind, if you will, that could potentially jeopardize agricultural research efforts. And we want to talk about that situation today. And two individuals very well versed in what it's all about have joined us. Kansas State University's Dean of the College of Agriculture, Ernie Minton, is along as well as the Vice President of Agricultural Programs at Oklahoma State University, Tom Kuhn. Ernie, we'll start with you. Agricultural research facilities at land-grant universities are very much in uh, suspension right now, to put it that way. That's right, Eric, and I'm so happy uh, today to be uh, joined with my colleague, Tom Kuhn, from Oklahoma State. He and I both have been involved uh, at the national level because this is a this is a nationwide challenge, land grant universities are facing a very sizable deferred maintenance problem, and uh, we're working hard to raise awareness and uh, make sure that uh, uh, the land grant university system writ large is hopefully uh, represented in the the broad definition of of infrastructure. Tom and I have been working uh, collectively with a company, a third party, uh, Gordion, who's put out a, a report recently that tallies that up at, at $11.5 billion, and that's just the catch-up cost. The, the keep-up cost is, is additional monies uh, in, in addition to that. So uh, we're going to be spending, and we have already been spending uh, the last month or so, Uh, really gathering support nationwide for that, and also within our respective states and regions as well uh, to get uh, ag groups, commodity groups, uh, et cetera, our stakeholders essentially uh, aware of this problem. Tom, Ernie cites the Gordian analysis. It included 97 institutions across this nation and uh, how far behind they are in funding for out-of-date agricultural research facilities. The scope of this situation is not to be denied here, is it? Not at all. The study that, that Ernie talked about is one, you know, part of the infrastructure that the United States invested in back starting in 1862 is that system of land-grant universities like Kansas State and Oklahoma State. Together, we actually work and coordinate what we're doing with each other so that our programs are complementary, our resources are complementary. And so one of the things we did about six years ago now is to say, hey, we're having trouble with some of our facilities. How about you? How about you? And that's when we brought in this outside firm to look at it independently. Someone who's an expert in facilities, particularly scientific research facilities, and say, tell us what the status is. So, you know, that study came out six years ago. At that point, the deferred maintenance cost that Ernie talked about was $8.4 billion dollars. 
Today, it's $11.5 billion. We did an update last year. As Ernie said, the, the investment that we need is even more than that. But starting with that number seemed like a, a reasonable place to start in trying to get ahead of this and bring us back into the international competition that we're facing. Land-grant universities have been known for their collaboration amongst institutions, but just collaboration alone and sharing of facilities, Ernie, that doesn't sound like it's going to be the solution to this. That's really true, Eric. We have, and I know Tom uh, has as well, uh, individual buildings or even groups of buildings that are in that category that were built between about 1950 and 1980. That was a time of rapid expansion of buildings at our land-grant institutions. And, you know, our scientists get a lot of great work done, and they continue to get a lot of great work done. But there comes a time when the mechanical systems and other things, they get to the end of their usable life. And unfortunately, a number of these buildings are in the 50 and older uh, year category and are experiencing that. So, you know, Tom and I both fund uh, wheat breeding uh, programs, and we have a unique grain science program here that really kind of focuses on the value-added parts of, of the end products of that wheat breeding program. And Schellenberger Hall and the Feed Tech uh, Hall, and, and many of your listeners will be familiar with that. That would be the building probably within our college that's in absolutely the worst shape. So we have world-class, you know, serial chemists that are working to serve the, the milling and baking industry, the feed science industry, and they're doing a great job. But again, there are these factors working uh, against them. So you multiply that across uh, the breadth of the United States. And, uh, you know, it's a serious challenge for the country. And Tom, by what Ernie says, this is not limited to a handful of research disciplines. It does cross a spectrum here, which, again, illustrates the magnitude of the problem. It really does. I mean, it goes from the fundamental bench sciences, you know, working on genomics of, of the wheat genome to, uh, you know, we've got a, a small scale feed yard here, a research feed yard for cattle. Uh, studying fee, uh, nutrition and herd health management. So, you know, it, it, it covers that whole spectrum. And that's where we are with some of our facilities. We can keep, you know, touching up here and there, trying to address the HVAC issues or or the, the safety issues, the, the electrical systems. But eventually you just have to cash it in and say, okay, let's get a new one here. Well, you cited again the studies number $11.5 billion worth of upgrading, renovating, repair necessary across the 97 institutions. But we often speak as well of the return on that investment. That has been studied likewise, has it not, Ernie? Yes, Eric, it has. The short answer is it's always double digits to one. But it's, well, in our case, we, we have data to suggest uh, from, this is from an external uh, group that evaluated uh, our programs, uh, 17 to 1. We put a dollar in, we get $17 in economic value back out to the state of Kansas in a variety of forms. Tom is aware of this too. I mean, sometimes it comes in at, at numbers that are just staggering, like over a decade of an improved, you know, wheat variety or whatever the case might be. Uh, you know, the number gets to be $38, $40 to one, that, that kind of thing. But it's always safe to say double digits to one. And so the point is, as land-grant institutions that bring in external research dollars into our state, they're spent here, they're used to uh, improve products and processes and so on, those really do have economic benefit to our, not only our respective states, but the region as well. Sometimes one of the best ways of, of measuring the return on your investment isn't, isn't just the dollar value of what comes back, but, but is anyone even using it? Is anyone paying attention? And so with our wheat breeding program, one of the things that, that we keep track of is, is how much of the wheat grown in Oklahoma is based on genetics from our breeding program. And it runs up close to 60%. 60% of the wheat grown in our state is our genetics. Uh, and so, you know, that, it's just an indication that our breeding program is being responsive to the whole, the unique approach that we take to using wheat as, as a forage crop, as well as a grain crop. 
uh, here in, in much of Oklahoma. So, you know, that's another measure of the return on investment is it's information that's getting used. And there are multiple other examples, of course, that time won't permit us to explore them all. Yeah. But the purpose of this conversation is to enhance stakeholder awareness of the urgency of the circumstances at hand. Is that fair to say, Tom? Absolutely. The, the thing is, we've been communicating with our uh, elected officials in Washington, uh, members of Congress, uh, our senators representing our states there, and other land grants have been doing that as well to make sure they're aware of the challenge. And it's one thing for a dean or a vice president to talk with a, a member of Congress or a, a senator, but it means a lot more when it's another constituent who says, hey, this is important to me. It's important to my livelihood. It's important to my community. And so if, if listeners are concerned, it certainly is compelling for them to reach out to their elected officials and say, hey, what can we do about this? How can we make sure that we aren't losing ground to China or Brazil or the EU in being the leaders in agricultural research in the world? Tom raised a, a fantastic point. And I think if you look at the trajectory of the investment of the U.S. in uh, food and agriculture, natural resources, R&D, versus other uh, countries, uh, uh, China would be, you know, one of the more notable ones, uh, you'll see we're falling behind. And, uh, you know, investing in infrastructure uh, to make sure that the U.S. is, is A, food secure themselves, but also our stakeholders can continue to participate globally in grain, livestock, and other commodity import-export markets, this investment uh, really is at the heart of that. If folks have questions, they can contact the respective colleges of agriculture at the two land-grant universities that you represent and others as well. We appreciate your time and your willingness to share these thoughts, Tom and Ernie. Absolutely, Thank you, Eric. Eric. Thanks appreciate a lot. Appreciate getting us together. And joining us on this part of Agriculture Today, the Dean of the College of Agriculture at Kansas State University, Ernie Minton, and the Vice President of Agricultural Programs at Oklahoma State University, Tom Kuhn. This is the K-State Radio Network. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Next up for you on Agriculture Today, input for you producers on field sprayer management. For those of you who've already made a few passes across the fields, as well as those who'll be putting down post-planting herbicides soon, Extension Weed Management Specialist Sarah Lancaster of K-State is a co-host of a growingly popular podcast, War Against Weeds. And on a recent installment of that podcast, Field Sprayer Cleanout was the subject of choice. Sarah brought in a peer expert for that, Purdue University Extension Weed Scientist Bill Johnson. And here's part of their conversation. Sprayer Cleanout. This is something that has, I think, gotten a little more press in recent years. And I'm wondering, Bill, if you could talk about why is sprayer cleanout so important? Yeah, well, I, I think it's a it's a hugely important topic. I think we're we're in an era now with our crop protection in terms of weed control where we have a multitude of different herbicides and traits that we can use not only in our corn crops, but in our soybean crops. And then as we kind of get away from the center part of the corn belt, we have other crops that we have to consider as well. In addition to corn and soybean, there's other crops that can be sensitive to the herbicides that get used. I think the other thing that we that we deal with is we deal with a lot of um, time constraints in terms of being able to get our operations done in a timely manner. And the labels, particularly for these oxen type herbicides, are so constrained in terms of when we can legally apply it 
uh, that we really have to take advantage of all the sprayable hours that we have. And so if, if, if we're using a sprayer to spray more than one crop or more than one trait, we have to make sure that cleanliness of that uh, spray operation from one product to the next is taken care of, or we can have some pretty damaging impacts on uh, on crop yields. And I, I think it's particularly important to things that are sensitive to things like dicamba and some of these herbicides that are active at really low concentration. So you talked about kind of the, the importance of timeliness. When is the best time to clean out your sprayer? Yeah, the, the best time to clean out a sprayer is, is obviously right after you get done spraying the last field with a, with a given compound. And the real key thing there is you want you want all of the herbicide residues to be solubilized in, in the spray solution and not sitting in the tank or the hoses where it can stick to things like the sides of the tank, the hoses, the, the screens and things like that. So you really don't want that spray solution to ever settle out or to sit in a, in a spray tank for very long. And, and, and again, we just want to keep it moving through the sprayer. And then when we're done with it, we want to move it out of the sprayer to get ready for the next load. Some of these products have pretty specific requirements for when and how to clean out the tanks. Do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah. And I think, you know, important thing we can bring out during this podcast as well is the fact that almost every compound that you use, whether it's a, a herbicide, insecticide, fungicide, or whatever it happens to be, has a specific cleanup section on the label to outline the best management practices for getting it out of the sprayer. And a couple key things to keep in mind is that almost every one of those statements will say, number one, empty the tank. Okay, empty the tank in the field that you're spraying in. And uh, there, there's ways that you can you can use up the rest of the spray in that tank and not damage your crop. You can put it on at a lower rate. You can make the sprayer travel faster. Uh, many of these big sprayers have an extra water tank on them, and you can dilute it if, if you need to, if you don't want to change your speed or, or that sort of thing. So first thing to do is, is to empty the sprayer. Um, the next thing you do is to fill that sprayer up with water, straight water, agitate it, um, run that agitation for whatever the label says, 15 or 20 minutes, and spray that out on a field that, that's labeled for that herbicide as well. So really, after you empty the sprayer and you do that first flush with water, then you start the more detailed cleaning process after that. And so I think, you know, a couple of key things to keep in mind here is number one, you'll have a, a specific clean out procedure for every compound. Number two, empty the sprayer. You can't clean it out unless the sprayer is, is empty, unless you've emptied all the active ingredient out of there. And then number three, pay attention to the, um, to the clean out procedure. There's about six different compounds that, uh, that these labels will state as far as what to use once you get to that rinse number two. So in almost all cases, rinse number one is with water, but when you get to rinse number two, some labels will say bleach, some will say ammonia, some will say a detergent, some will say um, non-ionic surfactant, uh, some will say a specific tank cleanout process. So pay attention to that because there's reasons why these different compounds are used. For example, when you use ammonia, um, you want to raise the spray solution pH, and that makes a lot of these uh, ALS inhibitors a lot more soluble when you raise the pH. But some of the other ones, again, the, the bleach is, is needed to help clean out the cracks in the hoses and things like that. And so after you get into this procedure, again, first empty, second is water, third is where you start with your, with your compounds. Almost all of the herbicide labels will say your cleanup process is a three rinse process. And that's the case for all but just a handful of herbicides. There's a few where it's less than, than three rinses. There's a few where it's up to four rinses. But for the most part, you're talking about triple rinse. And so, you know, we've always talked about triple rinse with regard to cleaning out containers. It's kind of the same thing with sprayer. So, Billy, you kind of ran through a list about some of the different products um, that the labels mentioned. Do you have any, any other insights about products to use um, to help enhance sprayer clean out? Yeah, and I, and I think, again, um, when, when we think about um, the amount of money that we're spending on herbicides and the amount of money we're spending on our crop protection products and traits, we want to pay attention to that herbicide label. And so there's specific directions on that herbicide label for each active ingredient. And there's not a single tank clean-out product uh, that fits every herbicide. So each class of herbicides is going to have a different type of product that, that's going to be recommended for use on that label. And 
you know, as, as we talked about earlier, there's about six different products that are mentioned on these labels. So one of them is a tank cleaning solution. Okay, some herbicides would just recommend use a tank cleaning solution because there's specific compounds in that tank cleaning solution that are good for that active ingredient. Ammonia is another one. Um, ammonia raises the pH of that solution. And so any herbicide that is subject to hydrolysis under high pH conditions um, is going to benefit from having ammonia in the spray solution. Bleach is another one. Bleach is one, again, very good at um, because it, it tends to have low surface tension. It gets into some of these cracks and crevices. But remember, you don't want to mix bleach and ammonia together. You can form a compound that can be toxic to humans. And so this is, this is why we have to read that label and, and make sure that we understand what we're putting in, in tanks. Other herbicide labels will say things like uh, just add a regular detergent like dishwashing soap could be good enough. So if a herbicide is pretty water soluble, it doesn't stick to the side of the tank, but you need something that will kind of foam up a little bit, detergent would work. In other cases, something like a non-ionic surfactant, which again is going to be a little bit like bleach, it's going to decrease surface tension, that's going to be helpful in cleaning that uh, sprayer out as well. So I think that the key message I would leave you with is much like making uh, the herbicide more efficacious on the weeds with spray additives, getting the herbicide out of the tank with the right cleaner is important as well. And so as you're making your uh, purchases for crop protection products, also shop for your tank clean out products too. And don't expect to go down to the retailer and, and have them make the decision for you because you could have two pretty different compounds that you need to clean your tank out just based on what active ingredients that you have. So that being said, are there any combinations that should be avoided of active ingredient and tank clean out product? I think some, some of them are just going to be less effective than others. And so if you're going into a really sensitive crop, you know, you need to pay attention to that. If you're not going into a sensitive crop with the next round, then maybe it doesn't matter as much. Mm -hmm. But if I, if I were, you know, if I were taking, let's say, a soybean ALS into corn, I would want to make sure I have the right tank clean out product. If I were taking a dicamba corn product into non-dicamba beans, I would want to make sure I've got the right tank clean out product. We want to leave you all with a few uh, recommendations for some additional reading in case you had some other questions. So some good resources might be um, a University of Arkansas publication called Tank Cleanout Recommendations for Common Herbicides. It has a, a pretty um, informative chart um, that goes through those number of rinses and what products to use that Bill was describing. Um, there's also a publication from Purdue University called Removing Herbicide Residues from Agricultural Application Equipment. Um, it's a little more detailed view on the steps to take and, and the goals there. And then there's also a good resource called Sprayers 101. So this will have some information about sprayer cleanout, but it's actually a pretty good resource for sprayer technology in general. So sprayers101.com is another resource you could check out. Is there anything, any other resources that you want to share with our listeners today? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll just take a couple of seconds here and just promote our activity on the Take Action project. So Take Action is a USB funded project to do research to manage herbicide resistant weeds and also create educational materials for the end user, which is ultimately the grower. So you've probably seen the advertisements in the farm magazines and on social media media and stuff like that. Uh, but there's a number of very helpful resources available through Take Action. So if you go to the website, IWillTakeAction.com, there are a number of um, publications and uh, videos that we have done over the last couple of years uh, as well that are uh, very informative and can help you with some of these weed management questions that you might have. Joining K-State's Sarah Lancaster there, extension weed scientist Bill Johnson of Purdue University. There's much more on this topic of field sprayer cleanout on this podcast. To find it, simply search for it by title, War Against Weeds. This is Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu.
Welcome back. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and time now for another report from that 2021 hard winter wheat tour of Kansas and adjoining states. And Romulo Lolato, K-State Wheat Production Specialist, joins us from Lane County in west-central Kansas. A quick summary of what the tour saw yesterday, Romulo, the the resulting average yield that the tour came up with from over 170 stops was uh, pretty impressive, was it not? Hi, Eric. Yeah, so yesterday the, the tour averaged about 59 bushels per acre, which higher than that first day of the tour uh, in for several years now. And I think that's a result of a couple of different things. One, we, we did see some very good-looking crop with, with good yield potential. It's also important to have a little bit of caution there because we this year the tour is going out two weeks later than usual, right? And so I'm not sure if the if the comparison to past years is uh, is a direct one just because we're going two weeks later and the crop is much more developed as well. And that plays an important role, especially in this first day where usually we see a crop that is still on the stem elongation phase. And, and yesterday we were stopping most of the fields were already flowering. And so the crop being further along, you know, I think that that changes a little bit the yield estimates that we will be doing. Definitely we saw many good looking fields. Uh, we also saw several uh, issues that were arising with the crop, even though the yield estimate was 59. Uh, and we did see several good looking crops. We are going two weeks after our usual timing, so that's important to keep in mind. And you brought up that there are issues, and the primary of those is likely late-arriving diseases. Is that the case? Well, definitely. We we saw several diseases, Uh, so striped rust was was an important one that uh, we were actually seeing uh, relatively consistent, not necessarily in, in levels that were too alarming in terms of like, uh, well, just seeing that the the crop definitely needs a fuller fungicide, but definitely in levels that the growers should be at least considering. So striped rust was something that we were seeing all over the board yesterday, more frequently in those central Kansas fields, a little bit less frequent as we move out west. We are also seeing consistently amount of barley yellow dwarf. So essentially, I believe that every single field that at least that our car stopped by we were seeing barley yellow dwarf at different levels. Nothing that necessarily would be too alarming either, but at different levels. Now, one theme of uh, yesterday that uh, seemed to be consistent across many of the cars was just the within field variability in growth stage. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we were getting into those fields and perhaps we were seeing wheat plants that were anywhere from early boot stage all the way to flowering the same field. And that type of variability was mostly due to the soil moisture content at planting. So it's important to remember how dry we were in October. And so guys who were planting in October, uh, maybe they, the, the crop was able to partially emerge at that point if you hit moisture. But whenever we didn't hit moisture, then it was not emerging until November. And sometimes even up to the first of the year, the, the parts of those crops were not emerged. So that was a very consistent theme that we were seeing throughout the route yesterday, the first day of the tour, very high within field variability in terms of a stage of development of the crop. I think the most extreme cases that we saw in our own car were in the western third of the state, fields that we stopped that were planted after corn. So they're typically planted on the late side already to start with. But you know, there were variability within the same field of plants that were still tillering all the way to the plants that we're almost heading. So that's a huge variability in growth stage. Uh, important to remember that probably those late plants are not going to yield as much as the early planted within that same field. That can cause some issues with harvest as well in terms of uh, height of the uh, of the header of the combine and especially maturity of the crop, right? There, there might still be green plants out there when the bulk of the field might be ready to harvest. So uh, some issues that we don't see every year, especially in terms of uh, these different maturities within the same field. And you are seeing similar conditions as you wind your way from Colby through west central Kansas today and eventually taking a hard left and heading towards south central Kansas? Yeah, so so far uh, it's been quite variable. Uh, I mean, from the few fields that we, that we stopped at today has ranged from anywhere from the upper 20s to about 70 bushels per acre, so a very wide range. 
some fuels just seem to be in extremely good shape and very uniform, very consistent. And then you stop in a few uh, few miles down the road and the stand is just very variable, again, because of those fall conditions. We, in Lane County, stopped at a couple of fuels that were looking great from the road. And once we, well, once we tried to walk in, because it was as wet as it was, we were almost getting stuck there. But uh, a lot of wheat streak mosaic showing up as well. So I suspect that uh, at least if the early part of these days is an indication of what we're going to see throughout the rest of the day, uh, I think that variability is going to still be there. We might be seeing more striperous because we're going to go into a part of the state that is further along in development, especially as we head to south central Kansas. So we're likely going to see more striperous. And wheat streak mosaic, I mean, we have already started seeing fuels that, that are much more taken with streak mosaic with street mosaic as we did yesterday. There's much more to see on the tour, of course, but unless it turns off dastardly hot and dry for the last three weeks of the production season or so, by the sound of it, this is going to be a pretty good crop, Romulo. That's what it looks like, Eric. I think I like to say that this last the set of rains that we have had and that we're still having this week, like we have a forecast of up to a couple of inches more within the next few days. I like to call it a multi-million dollar rain because <laughs> uh, a lot of this crop, it was on the verge, especially out west here. It was kind of on the verge. of It was already losing some of the lower tillers and lower leaves due to drought. So definitely this rain was very timely. Uh, it's important to think that at this point in time, all of the resources of the crop are being geared towards producing grain. So I expect that this rain is going to be used very efficiently, uh, right? If we had had the same amount of rain, uh, in the fall, it would not be used nearly as efficiently as the crop should use it now. So, you know, if we can maintain the, the temperatures cool for, for another at least week or so or, or a couple of weeks, you know, that's going to be really putting us in a good shape for yields that are to come sometime now in June. All right. Romlo, if you're willing once more, we'll touch base with you again tomorrow morning and pull together the story from day two of the hard winter wheat tour as it's currently progressing through western Kansas and then the southern reaches of the state today. Appreciate your time, as always. Yeah, thank you very much, Eric. And uh, just a reminder, if growers want to follow what we are seeing on on the route, uh, just follow me on Twitter there, at KSU Wheat, and uh, take a look at those uh, hashtag WheatTour21. That's a great follow indeed, at KSU Wheat. Romulo Lolato from the 2021 Hard Winter Wheat Tour. Romulo is a wheat production specialist, K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop. Look and listen. The iron wheels have only sunk deeper in the rotting leaves. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. Bill, my friend has been dead for many years now. When we moved to Kansas, I used to buy good hay from him for the pony. Bill, having grown up on a farm, appreciated farm machinery. In 2003, I wrote this short story, and that's 18 years ago. The old wagon. He bought it 20 years ago, and now he wants to give it to me. When my friend brought it home 20 years ago, he still could pull it. But once parked under the oak trees, it over time slowly sank into the ground, and all the woodwork rotted, broke. Only the four wagon wheels identify it as a farm wagon, as an old farm wagon, and has been farm wagon. But a farm wagon, nevertheless. I had never taken a good look at the remains of the old wagon, as it was partly hidden by neatly stacked firewood. 
What had sparked my interest were the four wheels, wheels of steel, iron. When I saw the rusted but still solid wheels the first time, old memories flooded my mind. The rusted wheels were the same type of wheels I remembered the first wagons had, new wagons provided to Dutch farmers through the Marshall Plan. Farmers who had lost their farm wagons during the war, World War II. After the war, there were no wagons with rubber tires. The German army had taken wagons and the remaining horses they could find to flee back to Germany as the liberating army moved closer. Those wagons had been the classical farm wagons with large spoked wooden wheels with an iron rim. I can still see the blacksmith's place, the hot rim on the wheel, partly burning it into place, beating it, and then cooling it so spokes, hub, and wheel would be tight. It was an art to make a good wagon wheel. But the wheels of the wagon behind the woodpile were iron, and as I looked at them, I recalled the brightly painted red wheels of the new wagon sent from America. The steel wheels would make no sound on the soft dirt roads, but once on a gravel or hard service road, the noise made by those wheels could make a young skittish horse freak out. The reassuring voice of the driver would calm the horse, but whenever you would roll onto a road which caused noise, the horse would perk up its ears, and you always paid attention. Whoa, boy, it's okay. Steady now. My friend knew I was interested in the wagon for sentimental reasons, as described above, but also for a practical reason. Steel wheels cannot get flat, nor low on air, which makes it very desirable farm wagon. Knowing my interest, my friend said, I am going to give you that wagon. He himself had wanted to restore it, But since he had not done it over the past 20 years, he hoped that I would. Ian and I drove out to take a closer look at the gift. We both admitted that it would be a challenge, but an interesting one, as even though the wood structure had slowly rotted, all the parts were hanging on or had dropped in the oak leaves. Together we lifted each wheel out of the decomposing leaves. They looked sound, and that was most important. The metal spoke still firmly attached. The running gear was there, but as I said earlier, time had destroyed the once good wood. However, the pieces could be traced to their function, making it easier to rebuild the wagon. Thorough, as my friend is, he brought me two books which show same kind of wagons. One book was the well-known Foxfire 2 book. It showed some clear photographs and detailed drawings of the running gear of a slightly different wagon, but will be helpful. Another book with the fascinating title of 380 Things to Make for Farm and Home shows a photo of similar wagon as given to me. The book was published in 1941 to help teach farm mechanics and farm shop. The year, 1941, fits the period. What makes this chapter on the wagon interesting is the fact that it provides the shop information on how to turn the four iron wheels into wheels that can take a rim for a rubber tire. It must have been a wanted or a needed change over from the road grinding metal rims to the smooth ride of rubber tires using the metal wheel. It's very cleverly done by cutting and bending some spokes outward and others inward, then welding the rim for the rubber tire to it. It's precision work that can be or could be done in any farm shop. But I do not want rubber tires. I want the iron wheels, and I'm very happy with the gift. Now the challenge is mine. I cannot wait 20 years. I'll be 90. So I have to get busy soon. 
I know Ian, the engineer, and Tinker will find it a fun project to help me. All we need is time. I told my friend I would try to hurry with the project so he and I might still enjoy a hayride on this old and restored wagon. We'll have to throw some hay bales on it as our old bones might bounce off as we cross the creek. But hey, it will be fun. I must find some bright red paint, the same red I remember. Thank you, Bill. Now remember, that was 2003. Next year, I will be 90. The iron wheels have only sunk deeper in the rotting leaves. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. Our time's away once again. As always, thanks for being along with us. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.